the well, stadium. Yeah. Where actually is it at the moment? How do things stand as far as your concern <coughs> as a hobby football club's concerned? Well, <coughs> as I described through there, um, you know, <coughs> the club itself was approached, the facility wasn't available or the option to, to come stay at the beach as part of the master plan. So we've been actively supportive of um, the council's plans, in particular working with some of the officers there, Steve White and Craig Innes. And, um, you know, obviously the administration has changed and, you know, we're going through some challenges post-COVID, hopefully post-COVID, related to, um, you know, um, inflation. Like I said, it brings it home when you say a primary school now is going to cost 30-odd million versus 22 million. Um, but the, the key thing is this, is the meeting the council has this week, you know, our appeal, if you like, is past that meeting is for us to effectively form a working group to look at how we can actually pull this off. That's important because, you know, we have been out with a council and talked to potential funding sources, right? Whether it be grants for net zero stadium and facilities down here, leisure center. But you can only really get into dialogue with these people when they ask the question, is the council totally behind this? Then, you know, obviously the, the, the press recently and, and, and the comments from the, the co-leaders, um, you know, have, have made their statements. And so for us, I think it's important that we all get together past this meeting and sit down, form a working group and, ev and evaluate every opportunity we have to pull this off. Because if we can bring, as a club, 38 million people to the stadium, which is almost double what it is at Pataudry over the next 50 years, because it's a community stadium, and we can generate at least a billion pounds of economic upside for the city, not for the club, it's compelling. So our appeal to the council overall is for us to get together to try and make this work. Do you believe the will is still there, and it's still the same as it was when this project came up two years ago, 18 months ago? Well, I think the things that's changed <coughs> clearly is, is, well, we were going through COVID then, at the beginning of COVID, and you know, the, the council at the time are thinking, how do we drive footfall? How do we, as a city, put Aberdeen back on the map to make it appealing for families to want to come and live here? This isn't just about the stadium. This is about the whole city centre master plan. So I think it's a bigger issue of what the Aberdeen City Council want to invest to provide an infrastructure to make it appealing for these companies and these employees and their families to want to come and live in Aberdeen. And so you've seen, and I've said it before, you've seen Dundee, right? Economically, Dundee had to do something, right? A few decades ago, they've had a plan and a vision and they've executed it with their waterfront. And, and that's what the council has a vision of, which I still think is worth the prize of going for. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the, um, the city council to kind of decide the shape and size of what this looks like. This is a capital investment project. It's not about taking money from, you know, uh, put, t getting the trash in or the bins and stuff like that. This is a capital investment that Aberdeen seriously needs to make if we're going to be the renewable capital energy in, in Nicola's mind of the world. And so for us, it's a bigger picture. And, you know, I think it's difficult for me to predict, you know, how a council drives itself there. But I do think there's significant support uh, for the city centre master plan. Within the, the council, you mean? Yeah. yeah. What I was going to ask you is, supposing in a kind of best case scenario, the council were to turn around and say, okay, we'll help, we'll put some money in, but you put some money in. How much realistically could you afford? Well, the difficulty in answering that question is, is that as we're out looking at partners and potential commercial partners, this is a big venture. And so you have to go out 
And we've talked to consult experts that do this on areas that re revitalize, whether it be Everton, whether it be in Atlanta, of the Atlanta Braves moving outside the city, they built a whole village there that has got four million visitors a year now. But it's something like that. You have to be able to um, effectively put your best foot forward. Say, We're all in this together. Here's what the cost of this project is going to be. Where are the funding sources? I can't tell you how much we can raise until I can go out there with the council to these sources and the council's behind getting it done. I mean, it's so imagine we're meeting and we've met with all of the above. You meet with these people, the first question they ask is, is the council really on board with doing this? But it must have been a kick in the teeth for you, for the club, when the coal leaders turned around and said, you won't get a penny from us. Well, look, I, I, I mean, for, for us, we're willing to work with the council and whoever is there with the council. The council approached the football club about what the, because what they thought the club could do for the city by staying in the city centre. We're not talking about building a football stadium. We're talking about building a community stadium. Why would the club go to the lengths of building a community stadium that gets used every day of the week, right, as an environment? And it could be businesses coming in there with coffee shops, shops, restaurants, etc. We ordinarily wouldn't build that on our own. And so we've been a willing partner. And so, it, it, so if you think about, you've seen all the designs between the, the shared facility, between the, um, ice, the new ice rink and kind of high-end leisure center, maybe in a spa. So, um, yeah, we're still willing and able to get into dialogue, but, but it needs all of us to come together. So the council meet on Wednesday to discuss it. And so that's your message to them. Keep, keep the door open. Yeah, the message is, is that for Aberdeen, never mind the club and the stadium, for Aberdeen, if we don't invest in the infrastructure, if we seriously want to go from oil, right, fossil fuel, to renewable energy, right, we've got to invest in the, city, in the infrastructure of the city so people want to come and live here. There's no Debenhams. There's no John Lewis's, right? The leisure centre is on its last legs. The beach ballroom's hemorrhaging cash, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's important to put a master plan together like these guys have done and, and look at the whole thing. It doesn't all need to be done in two years. It could be 15 years mm -hmm. that this takes to... But if you have to have a vision and a plan. And that's our appeal is to these guys is, is not to have a go at people or the council. I don't want to come across as that, is that we're still willing and able to work. But um, it needs the council to come to the table with us to go out to all of these sources. I mean, some of these sources are going to look and go, well, if there's no football club there, why should we support this here? Because you're not going to get the footfall. You know? So... What happens, worst case scenario, they say no? Well, then if, if it comes back that it's not feasible as a project, then we've got to go back and kind of dust off the plan at Kingsford. And has that just been mothballed for the last two years, or have you still been doing work well, in the, the background? No, the plans are still there that we've got. The thing is, we've already spent two and a half million getting the ground ready for the new stadium. Yeah. I mean, we, um, we, uh, the old beach end was dumped out there. Bert McIntosh took this down, the old beach end, and put it at Kingsford. So we've been actually redigging up the old beach end out at Kingsford to get it ready for the new stadium. It's a bit funny, but it's true. But if, it was, if you were to be at Kingsford, how much would that cost you? Well, it depends on... Um, it depends. The spec wouldn't be the spec of a community stadium here. Yeah. So it's ludicrous that people think the club's looking for a handout. It's like, why would we build an 80 or 90 million community stadium when we could build a stadium at Kingsford for 50 million? Right? But does it make sense? It doesn't make sense for the city 
to revamp the beach ballroom, to build a new leisure center, a new pool, and do that, if they're not going to get traffic of 38 million people over the next 50 years. Is, is that one of the perceptions that you've got to overcome, that we're in this cost of living crisis, folk kind of got another bar on the fire, and people are going, well, why should a football club get that? But what your message is, this isn't a handout, this is part of a bigger thing that's going to bring in revenue long term. Well, it's really about, does, if Aberdeen wants to set itself up for what the First Minister has said, we want Aberdeen to be the renewable capital energy of the world. Not UK, not Europe, but the world. Listen, you walk down Union Street, you look at the beach, what is there for people to do? You know, they look at other cities. And so if we want to get those, let's call it tens of thousands of jobs for Aberdonians as well as, as entice people to come and live here, we've got to have an infrastructure where people want to come. You know, you walk down to the beach and you look at the, oh, you've got flumes there, now they've been shut for eight years. You know? Um, but the reality is, it's a capital investment. And nobody's saying all of the money needs to be paid for by the council. If we get together, go down to central government, right, where you've got, for example, the UK Infrastructure Bank, is a new bank with 40 billion to lend at low interest rates for renewable energy projects. I've been and talked to them, right? But the first thing they say is, is the city council behind it. There are the Scottish government. I mean, if they'd really want Aberdeen to be the renewable capital energy of the world, which would be a massive boost for Scotland, and people coming here and spending money on stuff, right, then that's where the billion of upside just on the stadium you know, um, uh, element comes from. Then, you know, we could have got to all these sources. But I, I know myself, if I go into a room to try and help raise... <clears throat> you know, funding for something, if all of the stakeholders or a key stakeholder isn't there to say, listen, we're not guaranteeing anything, but we're behind evaluating this thing without putting a precondition on it, which is no support whatsoever. <clears throat> we, we need to get together, the, 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 the leadership, council, officers, ourselves, and, and give this an opportunity because we got these councillors, <clears throat> they meet on Wednesday. In my view, people will look back over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years and look at the decisions they made. And as they look there, did Aberdeen become the net zero capital of the world? And if it didn't, why not? Will you be in the public gallery tomorrow? Uh, or Wednesday, rather? No. no. I've said enough. Um, listen, it's in... If you look at the report, it's in there as part of the master plan to go forward, but clearly the funding is the issue that's there. So again, my appeal, I don't want this to come across as having a go at A, B, and C, blah, 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 is really we're willing and able as a club to sit down, but we all need to get together and get behind it to see whether we can get it done. Sure. I think the club, honestly, the club, we are attractive to help the council get grants and get funding because we're part of the economic viability of it. It seems you really think the future of Aberdeen as a, a city is wrapped up in this project. It's massive. Listen, we spent 400 million on Teca. It's, it's a fantastic facility. Can you imagine if we spent 400 million on revamping the city centre? Uh, you know, I, I, and I'm not saying that's what we spend, but and it doesn't need to happen when money is tight. But there's a difference between going out to get capital investment and borrowing than raising money to pay to empty the trash cans each, each week, you know? It's a different revenue budget versus an infrastructure budget. And, you know, we can have what we've had in the last 60 years in the next 60 years with renewable energy. I mean, the wind farms are gonna be three miles offshore from here, but we've got serious competition. I mean, the Northeast of England, they want all the jobs. Serious competition. That when people take a look at where they wanna live, right? Then they're gonna look, these families are smart these days, do I actually wanna go and live there? You know? 
So for me, the question is, is, is this is bigger. This is about Aberdeen for the next 60 years. And, you know, it's an independent economic report. This report was commissioned by the council officers in the club. We chose to publicize it because we felt it needed publicized. And that was all right, you know? And um, it, it, it independently done, Fergus Much, who SNP kind of by background, he did the economic report. And so, um, but you know, we all know historically when administrations change every five years, things can kind of change. So again, our appeal for Aberdeen is, let's try and make this happen. So when the people you speak to ask if the council are 100% on board, what do you tell them? And the kind of part, second part of that question is, do you think this is going to happen? Well, I mean, to answer the first part, um, they know from conversations in the last month that from, from information, they know that, um, you know, that there um, is serious concern at the council about making it happen. So, you know, as I say, it, you have to have all parties come around the table to do it. Listen, I'm an optimist, right? Um, bit of a realist as well. I, we are doing Aberdeen City and the North East a disservice if we don't explore this. And I don't just mean the beachfront, I mean the whole city centre. You know? And again, it, you might take 10 to 15 years to execute the programme, but listen, smart people have a vision and a plan. That plan could take 10 to 15 years. It's not 400 million or whatever it is tomorrow, you know? Anyway, I, so I, I'm an optimist and you would think the prize for Aberdeen is that renewable capital of the world. That's the prize. The First Minister says she wants Aberdeen. Scotland needs it. If the beach stadium doesn't happen and Kingsford, there's a split opinion amongst the fans about the Kingsford development, would that not be the time maybe just to take a step back and be the hero amongst a lot of the Aberdeen fans and commit to doing something you've said isn't possible over the last number of years, doing something with this place? Well, for the reasons we mentioned in the meeting there, it's just finan financially, it's just, it's just not an option because it's going to curtail us with our plans for growth and turnover significantly. 53% of our season ticket holders live closer to Kingsford than they do to Pataudry. How many? 53%, so about 50-50 from people that are outside the perimeter, so to speak, versus kind of inside. Um, so these are our options. We want to put our efforts into working with the council for the beach for obvious reasons. We have a couple of questions just away from the, the stadium. I noticed in the, the AGM there, um, I think it was in response to a question about the club being able to hang on to young players and key players. And Jim talked about how there was, I think the phrase used, a hell of a lot of interest in Mayovsky, both in the UK and abroad. How, how difficult is it going to be, especially given the financial results the club have just posted, to hang on to somebody like that? If somebody was to come in in January even, and offer you a few million for winning the prize assets? No, uh, so there's a difference between operating profit and net profit, because it doesn't include player sales. And at the end of the day, cash flow is king, right? And, and, and you know, we are, uh, cash flow wise, we are in a good position as a club. Um, and it's been part of our strategy has been to move from just spending what we bring in to be competitive, to investing more in first team youth academy, like I said. Um, and so this is that kind of deliberate plan that we have. But we won't be, or don't need to be in a position to sell any players. Now, having said that, we're not gonna go back to the situation where we get nothing for Kenny McLean, or we got 100 grand because Norwich took him on a pre-contract, right? Um, and Ryan Jack, Shinny, and these guys all kind of left for nothing. Um, so I think what we've been able to do is really invest in the Youth Academy and in the recruitment team 
that we've got, and the analysts that are looking at these players, right, around, uh, across the world. And, um, you know, this summer was the first time that Darren had a full window, Darren Mowbray, been to 16 countries. And, um, you know, so um, we've got, for example, at the Celtic and Rangers games, we've got scouts from across Europe coming. And for some of these teams, they're not coming to look at Celtic and Rangers players, necessarily. I think that's a good thing. It's healthy because, obviously, we're doing something right with the players. You trade players where it's the right deal for the club and you've got, ideally, one or two years you know, left on the contract. So the young the academy guys, I mean, you know, because the academy's doing exceptionally well, we're getting a lot of attention. We're victims kind of, of our own, you know, success. But our, our pitch to the younger players, the under 16s, right, um, is that you'll get, there's a pathway here now. There's a real pathway to getting into the first team. And Jim's totally on board with that as well. Are we going to keep all of these players? Not necessarily. Um, we put our best foot forward. We go through the t with a player that may be assigned professionally with us, an under, uh, let's say, a 15-year-old player. We're going through, whether it's Jim, Gunnar, um, Barry Robson, they're all going through the attributes of the player and what that player needs to do in the next couple of years to be at this level. And so there's a detailed plan, a pathway that's there. I think we do a super job at it. Um, but, you know, uh, these under-16 players, you know, you, you, I mean, the, the, the Scottish government dictates any fee if somebody comes in and kind of tries to take these players. And, you know, relatively speaking, it's cheap. The English Premiership teams, these guys might give agents, if they want players, they may throw two million at ten young players. And they'll say to the agent, here's 200,000. You can take that to give to the club, player, parents, and yourself to bring the player in. And they run that lottery. And, and again, our message is, how many under-23 players have come to Aberdeen with just without having men against men experience, right, and done well here? How many young players under-16 have left Aberdeen and done well? How, how much has Brexit been a factor in that? Because English clubs can't sign, they can't stockpile the players from abroad that they used to. They're now looking up here. Well, I think it cuts both ways. First of all, it makes our market more attractive and it, um, it potentially increases the value you can get for players. You know, um, because there are typically be multiple people in for, whether it be a Calvin Ramsey or someone. Um, <coughs> But, um, yeah, I mean, Brexit has been hard for us because we've got to go through all of these processes where, you know, with the SFA related to the player coming in and getting, getting a, 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 a visa. Um, but the main thing is we are double down on the investment on the academy and looking at other players. I mean, it's unbelievable. Well, Willie Garner couldn't believe when he went through the whole, the whole how we look at players, you know, um, and, and search for these players. I mean, getting access to um, uh, contacts in, in, like, Portugal to get Duke, etc. I mean, we've been able to open doors now that we've never opened before. And people are looking at Aberdeen and going, that's the place I want to be for two or three or four years, right? Uh, Miofsky, we paid 650,000 euros for him. I mean, that's not chump change. You know, um, they turned down two million euros from Granada in the January window. We got them this, this summer, right? Um, but we think that was a, a good investment for us. He's loving it here. He's on a four-year contract. So there's no urgency from our standpoint. Um, no. But the reality is if people come in, you know, and... But the most important thing is, do we have a conveyor belt of people we can either come in through or that we know we can go out and buy? You know? You had, you became chairman, was it 2019? We were here and then you had COVID within a few months and then you've had various other 
tribulations. Have you been able to enjoy it yet? Or is this the first season that you've been able to go, you know what, everything's kind of coming together? Oh, listen, the, 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 <laughs> as soon as you think everything's coming together, you get kicked in the arse, right, typically. So I'm, you know, it's, last year was really, really tough. It was really tough because, you know, just what we went through. And, but, you know, in my business career over time, I've made appointments that haven't necessarily worked out for all the right reasons. And the, you then get judged on how you, how, you, how you address those things. And I think we've, uh, we've addressed that. Uh, whenever there's a transition, there can often be uh, challenges. Um, you know, we've, we're in a very competitive environment versus seven, eight years ago. I mean, Hearts and Hibs got relegated, right, um, the season we won the League Cup. And Rangers were in the, whatever it was, second or third tier. The good news for Scottish football is it's really competitive again. And Hearts and Hibs are well funded, you know. So uh, for me, this is it's not about money. It's about trying to put a smile on the city's face through the, the club and the community trust. You know, because if Aberdeen's doing well, the city typically feels good about itself. And so, uh, but no, last year was, was tough, but I've been through a lot in my, my life and you just have to, um, you just have to keep your head above the parapet and look at everything you're doing. Like I said at the meeting there and think, listen, I know we had a tough season last season. Everything else we're doing, right, we're, we're doing well commercially and otherwise. Good stuff. Thanks, Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you.